Uh, thanks so much, Karen. This is my first uh, Dreamers and Doers event. And um, just first of all, I wanted to thank, you know, Keisha and the team to really um, invite me and share my background. I don't really know kind of the, the mix of people here. So I'll try to obviously um, kind of give a broad perspective, but um, most importantly, I would love to answer like really specific questions if you guys have those towards the, towards the end. Um, so a little bit about myself. I studied marketing and retailing um, at Penn and um, I was really lucky to find a mentor who happened to be the head of the retailing initiative um, at the Wharton School at the time. It was a brand, relatively brand new program and I was trying to figure out what to do. And um, he told me about retailing and the, the idea of balancing this art, right, of fashion and the science with all the metrics and running a business really spoke to me early on. So it's like my first internship and it's all I've ever known since. Um, so. Um, I'm Mrs. Retail <laughs> in terms of my circle of friends. Um, I started my career off in the merchandising program at Bloomingdale's. That's where you kind of go back and forth between buying and planning functions. Um, I was always in women's ready to wear. I loved it. Um, after four years there, I switched to Warby Parker and helped launch their first store. Um, and that's where I really was able to focus and hone in on this idea of retail experience. Um, and during the early years, as I'm sure this group is comprised of a lot of entrepreneurs and um, startup folks, we, I wore a lot of hats. So in the beginning, I was, you know, a little bit of a store designer, a planner, a trainer, um, mapping out customer journey, doing kind of physical user experience things um, before I even knew what any of that was. So that was really exciting. And I helped to launch and then manage the first dozen or so stores. And um, I just left last October to start my own resort wear line, which is really exciting. And I'm about a month out from launch. So it's kind of, um, it was a perfect balance just personally of the two parts of my career. And I'm really applying like every single thing that I've learned in the past uh, eight or nine or so years. So that's really exciting. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Um, I can't even believe, like I've watched sort of Warby Parker grow, you know, and yeah. how many stores are they at now? Uh, they just passed 50. Oh, five zero? Five zero. That is incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Really crazy. Um, yeah. You know, I, I read an article recently um, that said that they were actually doing more in physical uh, retail, brick and mortar retail than mm -hmm. they were doing online at this mm -hmm. point, and they have some really interesting things um, coming out. So um, what are some, I know you mentioned like as you're going into launching your own resort wear line, yeah. like what are some, they're, they're definitely considered a, one of the leaders in modern retail and sort of the resurgence of brick and mortar. What are mm -hmm. some lessons, um, you know, that you will be applying to your line um, that you learned from, from Warby? Yeah. Um I want to say there it was, um, you know, the amount of detail and attention that goes into all of those details that comprise, right, this entire experience and engagement with a brand mm -hmm. and how important that is. Um, I think it's really easy for brands nowadays to kind of have a vision and kind of like top down the experience, right, in terms of like, this is how I think it should be. And, and I think that's great. But I think of, there's a fine balance between that and entering or observing your brand from really the customer's point of view. And um, having the level of detail and attention that someone like Neil Blumenthal has um, really, really helped me kind of understand the importance of that. So he would do these walkthroughs in the stores with me with us. And point out like if the books on the bookshelf weren't straight like that level of detail wow. yeah and at you know at the time I was like oh my goodness <laughs> like please just team let's like work together to get these bookshelves straight but you know the bigger kind of point of that now of course is is just realizing that every detail matters and it has to be super well thought out intentional and executed um, so that's definitely something that I'm taking out, taking along the ride for, uh, this new venture. 
Cool. Um, so you focused on buying and planning at Bloomingdale's, you mentioned, right? So yeah. um, what did you what do you think about that role prepared you for to work in um, retail to be a retail experience manager at Warby? Um, it's a good question. Probably n not much at all. <laughs> um, you know, it was probably the biggest pivot. They're both retailers and they both are, you know, have it was a direct to consumer experience. But besides that, um, I think it's interesting in a large company being able to really own and master one function was super interesting and important, especially for what I'm doing now. But that pivot to Warby Parker, a smaller firm, uh, but really, really high growth, um, enabled me to kind of think about the entire experience, not just specifically the product. The product is so important, right? When you're selling a product or the service, the service is really important. Um, but when I switched to retail experience manager, it was so much more about, we never discussed eyeglasses. It was crazy for like how many yeah. eyeglasses we were selling. We were discussing things like, you know, empathy, hospitality, studying restaurants, you know, the best restaurants and hospitality groups around the country and going to conferences, um, looking at the flow of like table, like negative space between furniture and the shelves and different elevations, right? So um, think, being able to think about it from a whole, you know, a much broader perspective was, was so important and I learned so much. Um, that the product almost became like, it's not really about the eyeglasses. And I really learned that really quickly. And no matter what you're selling, right, um, a pro whether it's a physical good or a service, um, there is a greater purpose for that. And kind of going back to the customer empathy point of trying to imagine, like, who is your customer at what point in their journey or in their day are they entering your store? With what intention? What kind of previous research have they done? Is it a high effort, a low effort for them? What are their expectations, right, given their previous experiences, purchasing eyeglasses? And how can we totally knock that out of the park? Wow. Understanding what their expectations are and then just going way above and beyond. And um, that was really, really fun being able to just create that experience from scratch. Yeah, that sounds really, really incredible and really intense. Um, <laughs> I can understand. I can understand now why they. Uh, well, I, this might be a metric that I'm pulling out of nowhere, but I'm pretty yeah. sure that I read that they either do more than or close to sales per square foot as mm -hmm. Apple. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So with that level of attention to detail, it sounds very Steve Jobs. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Not, um, it's, it, I think the last quoted article put it third to like apples and Tiffany, but yeah, really high square dollars per square foot. Metric. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you touched on some of the more emo emotional metrics, empathy, mm -hmm. hospitality, flow, you know, negative space, yeah. that sort of thing in the customer journey. Um, what kind of metrics and KPIs are involved in creating a, in a successful, um, to create a successful retail experience program? Like what were some of the actual uh, real scalable metrics that you had to focus on? Yeah, um, I would say a lot. I mean, we looked at all the standard, right? So top line revenue, margin, sell throughs, dollars per square foot you mentioned, conversion, average selling price, you know, on and on and on. Um, one metric that, you know, we really studied is the net promoter score metric, which is kind of a standard across all the retail industry. A lot of uh, retailers publish their numbers. Um, we had like a really, really high standard for the entire company. So, you know, as a, as a c customer, you would be able to opt in and get feedback about your entire Warby Parker experience. And what we're able to do, we found that there's a lot of feedback that we were getting that was not at all related to the retail experience, right? So there's always things like, um, you know, shipping or product quality, things that just the team had no control over in the stores. Mm -hmm. So we developed a, a specific retail experience metric um, that every 100% of customers were able to opt in and give feedback. The link was on the bottom of their order confirmation email. 
we had a surprising amount of people who wanted to give feedback, hmm. um, a pretty big opt-in rate. And um, what, was, what was great is that we're able to kind of measure on a similar scale to the total company NPS, but really hone in on the, you know, a series of follow-up questions that centered around the experience, the service, the knowledge level of the employees, um, ease of transaction, right? So what we thought were really controllable um, by and driven by the team at each location. Mm -hmm. And from then on, we did a lot of really interesting things like incentive programs, right? Being tied to that kind of stuff. So it's not just about hitting numbers, but it was really about how can we make sure that we are accountable for delivering these truly best in class experiences. So those incentive programs were um, for the employees in order to be del deliver the best experience? Exactly. Or, okay. Yeah. So okay. Like direct accountability for, and it was all team based, you know, so it wasn't like a competitive thing, but there was direct accountability for the service that they were providing. Okay. Um, I have heard that they are very, very fixated on net promoter score and mm -hmm. as an e-commerce um, brand as well, I've kind of been, you know, trying to follow in their footsteps like, hmm, yeah. how, can I, how can I do the same? How can I provide the best experience? Um, what are some ways that you think um, a brand could take that, you know, sort of emphasis on net promoter score and if they don't have 50 retail locations, as many yeah. of them I'm sure don't, like what are some ways you might intend to, to, um, to promote a high score for your own brand? Yeah, so NPS is not, it's an interesting metric and it's not perfect. It's a really harsh metric when you look mm. at the formula. Um, you know, nines and tens are considered promoters, sevens and eights are neutral, and anything uh, six and below is a detractor, right? So sevens and eights, so if someone says like eight out of 10, great experience, they actually don't do anything, if not like probably will hurt your score. So that to me was really interesting. And I think, you know, it kind of goes back to this idea of like, you can spend a lot of your energy kind of bumping everyone up one point, but I think the, the way that you can really maximize a bang for your buck in terms of your energy and resources is always how to focus, is always focusing on those neutrals and getting them to be promoters, right? So they had a good experience, but how can you make it great? Mm -hmm. And um, one tangible way that I think a lot of e-commerce brands or you know, any brand can really do that is with this element of surprise and delight. So kind of going back to understanding what normal expectations are and what are some things that you can throw into that experience that are totally unexpected and really worth, right? If you think about the question, like, would you tell, you know, brand XYZ um, about brand XYZ to a friend or family member or how likely would you be? That's the NPS question. So if you think about that, what is the incentive or reason for, for sharing your brand, right? It's not just like, oh, this good came in. I got this like great new pair of sneakers and they work. They're cute. Uh, it's like 50, 50 chance that they're going to tell someone about their, you know, about that experience. But Warby, we, for example, would send out like, I remember for the fifth, I think it was the fifth birthday of Warby Parker, like custom, really cute, small owl pinatas um you know or like books of jack kerouac uh, mm -hmm. for other birthdays and there was like a there's so many like different and fun things that we did like santa cookies one year with, the, with uh, during the holidays just things that were again not related to the glasses at all not expected um at all but um it was a specific program with like dollars dedicated to it um to make sure that the experience was really above and beyond. And so we do that with elements obviously in store um, with things like, um, you know, like stickers and candy in the exam room or there's, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a bunch of little touch points um, for this new brand that I'm, I'm about to launch, um, you know, and specifically from the checkout experience to the, to the unboxing. I remember you, you sent me a little note about that. Um, the, you know, the messaging on all those touch points, I think it's so important. It's something we like agonized over um, at Warby Parker is just where is the brand voice? Is that continuous in all these touch points um, that are otherwise kind of mundane? How can you like step it up, right? Well, the one example I always give is like Urban Stems and their checkout page. 
Hmm. As you're checking out, this little like dude is just running and it's like super <laughs> pixelated and doesn't make any sense. But every time I use it and I check out, like I have a little chuckle. Um, and I told that like, you know, as I am telling everyone right now about it, um, it's the small things, right? And um, in terms of unboxing, you know, I'm really trying to pay attention to the idea, this idea of obviously sustainability. So just you not using tissue because that's the expected normal route to go, but I'm going to instead package everything in a reusable scarf, um, wow. tie in a stick of like Palo, Palo Santo um, to really engage the sensory, you know, of experience and also smell to instantly kind of transport the customer to this kind of relaxed state of being. Um, so you can kind of see how, uh, not maniacal, but how detailed <laughs> that Warby experience is totally uh, applying to this new venture. Yeah, that's incredible. So yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I love that. Um, you know, we, we try to do a lot of thinking around, um, the, the human experience, you know, mm -hmm. of, um, of getting women our packaging and our, and our products as well. So that's really, that's mm -hmm. really cool. Um, it's so funny. I mean, I spend so much time sometimes like literally like packing boxes and all of that, yeah. that I'm just kind of like, Oh my God, I cannot wait till I don't have to touch this anymore. And now I'm like, yeah, maybe I should rethink that. <laughs> We should grab a drink. <laughs> and talk about that. <laughs> um, so I had a couple more questions, but yeah. before I even did that, actually, you answered quite a number of them. So um, it was really just one more question, but yeah. we are up to 17 um, people on the call. So I just wanted to open it up. I don't want to um, take up too much time in case everyone or many people have a question. Um, so if everyone, like if you see at the bottom of your screen, if you can see that it says um, participants and then it has like the little number 17 next to it, if you click on that, a little box pops up and you're able to raise your hand. Um, but if that doesn't work, just unmute and ask Laura any questions. Um, that you have, and hopefully not that everyone will ask at one time. All right. Okay. So I see uh, Alexis popped up. Hey. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so this might seem like kind of a funny question, but yeah. you mentioned as a recommendation um, to sort of try your best to view the brand from your customer's point of view. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you guys feel, but personally, like as the owner of my own brand, sometimes I find it really, really hard to like see it from the outside because I'm so mm -hmm. close to it. Mm -hmm. so I guess I'm wondering, like, do you have any recommendations for ways to sort of see it better from the outside? So, yeah, that you know? is so true. More, it's, it's such a valid question, I think, coming from like my new hat versus my old hat. Yeah. Um, Cause I agree. It's super hard <laughs> and I'm so, I feel so deep into this process at this point. Yeah. Um, I think the moments of um, kind of clarity that I've gotten is just through talking about my line with, with my friends. Uh -huh. um, and sometimes it's not every friend who will give you kind of the open and raw advice or perspective that, isn't kind of like the nice to hear, you know, like, oh, is, is $200 a too high of a price point? I have some friends for sure that'd be like, no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think having a specific set of friends or people in your network that you really trust to give an, unbi an unbiased uh, perspective who, uh, who also are your target, right, customer, um, I found to be super valuable. And I've definitely kind of pivoted things because of because of feedback um so i'm always polling <laughs> like i have just like a group of like 10 or so uh people that i'm always reaching out to like what do you think about this logo what do you think about this price point what would you pay for this right um but i think going back to the warby experience um something that we did um we started to do towards like the last few years was um this idea of it's almost like secret shopping um, but we would run a bunch of test orders so like what is the entire experience if you're just 
uh, ordering a non-prescription pair of sunglasses on our website. What are all the touch points and mapping it out um, as a customer? That was really helpful to see because then we could say like, oh, you know, you got one too many surveys or, you know, you don't really need this detail in your order confirmation email because that doesn't apply to non-prescription, for example. So, um, kind of picking, you know, your top five or so scenarios and um, reviewing like all the touch points as a customer. And this may not be you that you may enlist some help. Um, just ha ask like, you know, someone to order a pair of something from your website and document what their experience was, I think is also uh, really helpful. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Yes, yeah, of course. If, I actually have one other question, if you guys don't mind if I go again. Um, no, that's okay. A lot of, like, I think a lot of the stuff that you said is like, I would like to try to apply certain things to my company, but then I'm also a startup and I have a really tight budget. So do you have any like mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Like how to, you know what I mean? Cause like creating that experience, like I don't have a brick and mortar location right now. So like I would need to yeah. kind of create that experience more online. And if I did a pop-up, like, you know, you don't really have all that stuff to create, you know, the high low tables and like the flow and all that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so is it really just about like having a great story online or? Yeah, I definitely, um, I didn't touch on this earlier, but you bring up a good point. Like as a startup e-commerce brand, it's just ironic that my entire experience has been in brick and mortar, but I'm not touching anything in brick and mortar to start. Like, I don't think, right. It makes sense for everyone right away. So I think what you're doing is smart by not like opening up a permanent shop. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for those of you on the call who might be thinking about that, my piece of advice is always to kind of test and prove the metrics, like standard retail metrics, right? Um, prove that you can pump out the dollars per square foot that you need to, to, to make a, a, even a pop-up, then a permanent store, a, a wise decision. Um, but as a startup, you know, it's totally separate from that as like, if you're just going direct to consumer e-commerce, which is what I'm doing today, how I'm applying a lot of these lessons also on a pretty low budget are the things like combing through every single touch point from the hang tag to the confirmation email to um, the packaging. Um, and those are, you know, like I'm doing a generic box because I can't hit the minimum quantities for, you know, a super like, sexy box and that's okay and I can't I realize that you have to kind of give and take and you can't do everything that you would want to do but just being able to prioritize um, what you can and then interjecting at a pretty low cost right the, the Palo Santos idea when I looked it up it, it'll be like 50 cents a, a stick or something like that right so on a pretty low budget, um, just getting creative after prioritizing, but um, being really creative and intentional about every single touch point because probably saving money on not doing a tissue and a sticker, for example, um, and it, it creates a much richer story that way as well, right? So uh, are you all good, Alexis? Did you have any more questions? I mean, I could ask another question. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop over to um, yeah, a couple more guys. questions, yeah. first, and then we'll uh, we'll come back if we can. Uh, so, Sarah, did Sarah have a question, or is this? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. But I think you kind of just answered it. I was wondering also, like your key takeaways from Warby and Bloomingdale's for your startup and for us who were mm. kind of this small budget. Because I feel like I hear the stories of Warby and yeah you know, bonobos and i'm like that's nice but like i didn't start with any money or when any yeah. happens um so you know totally bootstrapping and i know a few other people on this call um, totally. on so uh, you kind of answered it but if you have any other thoughts of what you're kind of kind of distill from that larger experience to a yeah uh, experience T totally and now, now i'm like paying attention to everything that i buy online right like what is that experience? I'm saving like I'm a crazy person. I'm saving like all the tags and notes and things like that. And um, one thing that I noticed, uh, there's a jewelry line based out of France. I bought it as a gift, got the package. And um, what I thought she did really well was, you could tell, it was just like one woman just pumping out this jewelry from her apartment. Um, 
is is like the note that she included in her package um and it was just so thoughtful on on really beautiful stationery and you know that again doesn't cost a lot of money but the idea of really connecting with your customer through a personalized note is like no brainer for me and i'm I'm sure many of you guys already do that, but that's something I also plan to do. Um, and I think that extends not just beyond, not just to people who are already purchasing, but people who you really admire and respect out in the community, right? Influencers and things like that. I'm totally just going to be shameless and start reaching out to folks really soon, but in a really like, you know, genuine way that I, people that I have really been following for a while, um, and doing kind of personalized gifting and things like that. Um, I, I find so much more value in that as a brand for me personally than like a, a Facebook ad, right? So if I can connect with people who I think are super aligned with, you know, what I'm doing and um, gift them a bunch of things and not like pressure them to promote it, but, you know, hope that someone feels so passionate about it that one day they will. Um, I think that to me is much more kind of a sustainable growth method, right? Than kind of that, um, it'll always be a mix, but um, the, the kind of paid customer acquisition route. That's, it, that's what I'm banking on. <laughs> I'll keep you guys posted on how that works. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, Alice, you raised your hand. It looks like Hi. you had a question. Hi, I'm Alice. Hi. I have a direct consumer women's wear line called Uniform. I've been in business Ooh. about a year and a half. And um, I was, I'm curious about... Uh, I feel like we have mutual know, friends. <laughs> I'm sure we do. I have some yeah. friends with Bloomingdale's too. Um, yeah. I'm uh, curious about your customer acquisition strategy and if there are components of your experience at Warby, like pre, like you've talked a lot about what happens during the purchasing process and then when yeah. you receive the order and all of that interaction. But I'm wondering if... Uh, you can share anything about the process before then, like say you get press, it drives traffic to your website or you, you have like mm -hmm. uh, foot traffic into the store that maybe that, I think, did you call it low effort? Like somebody who may not be as engaged. How do yeah. you engage that person and, and uh, whether or not they make a purchase? Yeah, I would say um, the funnel with, with customers, um, you know, definitely from the beginning, press was a huge, huge component for Warby. Um, they have a rock star team and like day one, we're basically in Vogue and GQ sold out of their home try on inventory. Right. So it's kind of like this like amazingly beautiful unicorn story. Um, in terms of the, the, the foot traffic in stores, definitely location played a huge part in that. That was like a very deliberate decision for Neil to want to open our first store in Soho. It was like, I think I heard at one point like a five block radius or something, you know, very specific. And that store does really, really well because of that location. Um, so once they're in the store, it's, you know, again, like that focus back to hospitality and service. Um, I think from a four wall experience that the people in your, in the store are like the number one important thing, right? So we, we just put so much emphasis before even customer experience on employee experience, um, hiring the right managers, hiring the right team, keeping them motivated. The back of house of all the Warby stores are like beautiful and like kind of mirror the, the corporate office with like snacks, you know, like really making them feel like they're a part of something much bigger. Um, and, and then having that kind of trickle down into these like right service standards of like specific types of greeting, um, minimal, minimizing confusion and otherwise what could be like a confusing process for people. It's not like you're buying like eyeglasses all the time. Um, and so, you know, we focus a lot on like reading body language, adaptive service and things like that. So I would say once they're in, just like winning them over with the service piece. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Do you guys have pop-ups at at uniform or any story? Uh, I did a three month pop up last year. Okay. Um, cool. But it was definitely, I don't know if the amount of effort, time, and money invested into it at that yeah. point before I have really enough for traffic and enough like ways to engage uh, like existing email list members. Yeah, I think like for a small yeah. brand with limited resources, yeah. even though it can drive sales, 
like you sort of have to look at the costs. Totally. Uh, um, like not only the, the uh, financial costs, but also the time and other things that you've been doing that can drive like greater exactly. growth. Yeah. One thing that we did at Warby from the beginning, and I recognize like brands like Glossier are doing, is opening a very small footprint within your own office. I feel like that's like, if you have any semi showable office space, right? Like the first showroom of Warby Parker was Neil's living room in Philly while they were still in business school. So that I always recommend. And we've um, since then always had a small showroom in the office and we start, it, you know, once we moved off from office to office, we were able to dedicate more of like a, an actual floor space to it. And we started measuring all these like standard retail metrics based of based on, out of that office space, um, like dollars per square foot even. And that led to the first pop-up, right? So there was like, predated kind of um, exercises that really helped to show showcase the need for and the demand for um, and super fortunately they had that but that's something that I always recommend if you're able to carve out a little space in your office to have mm -hmm. people come and do that and, and engage with your brand that way. Can you tell us anything about your upcoming project and yeah. What you're looking to? Yeah. If I can jump in really quickly, can yeah. we finish? I'm actually going to ask Laura to finish up oh, with that okay. so that we all get a good sense of it. And oh. um, I want everyone else Yay. to actually jump in as well. Um, but I wanted to get to a couple more questions so we can make sure everyone gets a chance. Uh, so Kendra, you had a question? Yeah, this is actually a, um, a two-part question. So mm -hmm. do you have any information regarding like customer service or um, companies that would be able to support as far as live support on the website so that you know customers have questions they can get that answered you know right away and then secondly as far as managing inventory or how much inventory you need to go to market and what software you would use to manage that effectively yeah um, live support, we did everything in-house at Warby, but I know that there are a couple of companies. There's one based out of Nashville called, I'm sure someone else might know this on the call. It's like some girl's name and it's like Emily or something. Does anyone know? Is this ringing? Oh, is that? it Amy? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, it's, um, Oh gosh, this is really, I, I can definitely find out. Um, okay. Lisa Nashville. Uh, Emma? I don't Emma think that's it. Familiar. Emma, right? Emma. And there's like a little yeah. like girl logo thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to say it's Emma. There's also um, a friend of mine is doing like, uh, she has her own startup with like um, experimenting with messenger and live bots, like bot support. Um, I don't know if that's something that you're interested in. It, you know, obviously it depends on what like point of, of your like scaling and journey that you're in. Um, but everything was done in house at Warby. So I'm not super familiar with other live support systems. Um, let's see, there was another metric that our customer experience, this was not support, but more so feedback startup and, um, Basically, you're, you're able to answer, oh gosh, no. Everything was so in-house at Warby that a lot of the outside systems, even the inventory and POS, uh, were all built in-house. I'm not super familiar with. Um, for my own company, um, I'm doing a lot of my inventory management and such in Shopify and check out via Shopify because what I like about that it, it does have that flexibility to add locations and I know other startups like Jack Irwin and um, I'm blanking but that was that was one thing that really drew me to that this idea of like one system that can, that's pretty plug, plug and play to begin with that can um, kind of cross channels eventually okay so basically Shopify would be the preferred over like a Squarespace. Yeah, because I, I don't know if Squarespace can do physical inventory management. And I've heard okay. just less, it's less easy from like a back end system. And I, I'm not sure if like I'm all pre launch right now. So if anyone else has any experience between the two, I'm, I'm seeing a, yeah. Olivia. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, 
definitely Shopify. I started out on yeah. Squarespace and it was a waste of money. It's, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. for, like if you're a platform that doesn't need the um, e-commerce support, yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. Shopify is hands down much better than Squarespace yeah. to manage inventory, get reports. Mm -hmm. It just gives you much more data um, and analytics than Squarespace does. Okay. I will say that the Squarespace templates I found to be, they just spoke to me um, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I found this plugin where you can add a button to do all your uh, checkout on Spotify with a Squarespace template front end. Um, so that's what I'm going to launch with. I both. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have Aishwara next. Let me know if I totally bungled the pronunciation of your name. I probably no, don't. you got it, which is awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to hear a little bit about content strategy and mm -hmm. um, if that plays played into how you're thinking about launching, um, if you plan on um, adding it later on and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you mean specifically to just like ongoing content or? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that could come in various forms. I don't mean, so I, I think I'm excluding social from that, but, um, okay. this would mean like either a blog or people are starting to like companies are starting to do like, um, zines or mm -hmm. their own cute little, magazine type of thing, um, just as like a kind of customer education and yet serves as yet another touch point for people to get to know the brand better. Yeah. Um, are you, are you seeing that that's still sort of like a, a thing or are people kind of veering away from that? <clears throat> yeah, I think it really depends on like your core strength or anyone on your teams. Right. And if that comes really natural to you, I think use it. Why not? Um, for me, that's not really my core strength that, you know, the idea of, um, like updating a blog, for example, kind of gives me anxiety. <laughs> and once you launch, once you put it out there, right, it's really, you're like making yourself accountable to keep it fresh and updated and interesting. And, um, I, I don't think that's like the most valuable use of my time as a first time founder of this brand new line. So, um, what I am doing and you kind of like brush it off earlier, but definitely thinking about content on social and how to keep engaging. Right. Because that is just like a given way that a customer or prospective customer is going to engage with your brand. So um, for me, you know, you mentioned this idea of like education. That's really important because what I'm doing with my line is um, super thoughtful and it's sourcing and production. So uh, like, for example, this piece I'm wearing, it's all hand spun yarn and hand woven in India. And um, I think a lot of customers out there really are starting to be more curious about what that means. Um, and I think a couple of brands out there like Zadie and um, Matters out of Singapore and, you know, people treat people tree I think that's what it's called um, it's just something that a lot of brands are starting to do and I think um, the more we put out there it can't hurt I don't know I, I kind of go back and forth whether or not like um, educating customers is going to like change the industry but um, my point of view is that it can't hurt so I'm definitely like I have a friend slash photographer out, out in India documenting the entire production process, like going to these villages in Southern India and Eastern India. Um, and that all that content will live on, on the website, the core website. Um, and then layered on top of that, um, I think really trying to understand like the purpose of what I think my brand can do for people, which is kind of enabling them on their journey and documenting other people on their journey and how they strive to seek a balance. So, it's this resort where this idea of resort where not just like, let's go out on a beach vacation, but how can you really um, live this idea of doing and not doing and relaxing, but also working hard and doing all of that um, in your own personal journey. So definitely want to create content around that for social, but I don't imagine that living on like a blog or the website. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. That was a really great question too. Yeah. Um, so we're at 
345. Um, you know, we can go over like a little depending how things are going. Um, but I wanted to, if I didn't see any other um, questions coming up. So I thought it might be good to actually just kind of go across. So I'm, I have the list of participants here and I can go down everyone's name. And if you can actually just um, get like 30 seconds, you know, tell us in one sentence what you're working on. And um, actually, I thought since it's like a really intimate call and we may have crossover in our needs or experiences, I thought maybe um, you could say what you're working on and also say if there's an ask that you have, if there's anything that you kind of um, need to know or sort of worried about or, you know, whatever. And we'll see if there's anyone in the group who um, can be of helpful. We can follow up in email or something like that. Um, and you don't have to do that either. I see people already like, okay, I'm out of here. So, <laughs> um, so if that's cool with everyone, um, you know, they definitely suggested that we just kind of get a sense of, of everyone's needs and what you're working on. So I wanted to go back to um, Aishwara since you are an A and you're first up, <laughs> first up in my participant list. And um, yeah, you can let us know what you're working on. Sure. Um, I am... So I don't know how many of you know this, but 80% um, of the uh, of Americans are consuming rotten and rancid olive oil. And so all of the olive oil that you're getting from Whole Foods and Trader Joe's is already gone bad. They're using deodorizing machines to make it not smell that bad. Wow. And, um, Whole Foods carries 40 types of olive oil and only one of them is actually legit. And nobody really knows how to find good olive oil. And so like all of the health benefits that you think you're getting, you're not getting. So long story short, um, I'm building a direct to consumer olive oil brand, um, e-commerce brand, uh, that's going to live online. And um, I, I think as far as my asks, I would love to speak with um, anybody who knows sort of like pre-launch customer yeah. testing. Like, okay, the story really matters, but how much do people truly care? Will they really be compelled to, you know, make the purchase? And then um, I'd also love to chat with somebody about pricing strategy too. Um, okay, that's fantastic. Uh, if everyone uh, just can keep your mics muted until um, until I call you up, that'd be awesome. Um, all right, so Alexis is hey. next. Hey guys, um, I'm Alexis, and my brand is Alexis Mira. It's a women's activewear line, um, and it's ethically made in New York City. So I work at the factory in the Bronx, um, and. The basis of the line is sort of very uh, simple and easy to wear silhouettes so women can feel like themselves. Um, so the women wear the clothes and the clothes don't wear the women. It's sort of about being yourself and for real women, that sort of thing. I'm also extending into plus size suit as well. Um, my ask um, would be, if you guys don't mind, uh, to check out my website and take a look at my line and everything. and send me some feedback if you have a few moments. Anything that comes to mind, really. What's your, Alexa, what's, what's your website? Uh, sorry, it's Alexis Mira, A-L-E-X-I-S. Mira is M like Mike, E like Eric, R like Ron, and A like apple.com. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Alice, you're up. Hi. Um, Wait, so what was, until your line launches, Aishara, what is the olive oil from Whole Foods that's okay? <laughs> <laughs> there are some small producers in, along the central coast of California and um, in Ojai, and they're producing, they have mills, and they're doing it the right way. And the problem with them is that they don't have distribution. So they're thinking about things like, oh, let's get people to the door through a tasting, maybe sell them two bottles. And then if you go to their website, they either don't even have an e-commerce kind of capability or it looks like it's from 2004. Um, and so, yeah, long story short, um, there are a couple small players out there, but there's nobody really thinking about it from a 21st tech, like century kind of way. Okay, oh, darn. Okay, um, so I, as I mentioned, I have a line called Women's Wear, uh, sorry, a Women's Wear line called Uniform and, um, I'm now working on moving towards a wholesale model. Um, so if anyone has experience, you know, going to market as a wholesale brand, um, and actually particularly I'm getting ready to fundraise. So if anyone has experience fundraising, um, particularly with like wholesale assumptions, um, I'd love to talk. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, Alexis, I actually have a background in wholesale in the fashion industry. I was an account executive for like some of the major Italian brands for many years. And I worked with everyone from, um, you know, boutique retailers to like Saks Fifth Avenue, Barney's and so on. Um, so shoot me an email at vshave, O-U-I-S-H-A-V-E at Gmail. And um, I... Did you get it? Or yeah, I, I did. It? I okay, did. I got good. it. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'll set something up. I can tell you a little bit more about wholesale. Um, okay, cool. Candice, are you feeling chatty? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so I, I'm from Australia, and um, I got to the US a couple of months ago, and I'm here um, to launch a, a leather bag brand. Um, and I'm currently in sort of a prototyping phase and now looking for local manufacturers, just literally in New York at the moment. Um, but I think the thing that I'm really curious to hear from the group is I'm, I'm, I'll need to start thinking about kind of warehousing and, and like the logistics start, side of things. If anyone's got any experience with that and any recommendations, especially when you're small, um, I'd be all ears. Great. I actually just checked out a few spaces at Industry City in Brooklyn, but oh. wait, you're not, are you going to be staying in New York? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, they were relatively, like, affordable when compared to other sort of, like, co-working or, like, studio spaces that I looked at in Manhattan. So that's, I mean, if, if you're looking for, if you're talking about actual space, that would be something to look at. Yeah, great. I mean, I guess I could hold a lot of the inventory at home but um initially when it's only a few units but um yeah i was just curious to see what what everybody else does once they get a little bit bigger yeah i'm i'm currently holding inventory at home which you guys might be able to <laughs> find me. um but that's why i started looking at industry city because i feel like i'm kind of growing out of my little home office got it is that a what is industry city is that an a, an area or is that a business or it's like a creative um like workspace co-working type thing um in sunset park in brooklyn um so yeah you can get like your own it's not co-working like a we work kind of thing it's like you can get your own private little studio spaces that sort of thing but they're the size is pretty decent for like what it costs i think um yeah so yeah thank check you. it out thank you yeah. alexis would you mind emailing or send or what's the the specific um it's industrycity.com Okay. And actually, <laughs> if you want me to connect you with like the leasing, I don't know, whatever her position yeah, is, that'd or, be great. Whatever, I can do that. You can, yeah. do you want me to give you my email address? Well, yeah. it's in a, I, I can, uh, I'll, I'll, can, I'll take everyone's email yeah, and connect yeah. everybody on the call okay. and you guys cool. can just kind of go from there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Candice, there is, um, there's a fulfillment center in Brooklyn called Ship Bob. Uh, I've been looking at them. Everyone is sort of like back and forth with fulfillment. You know, a lot of people, especially for smaller brands and, and you know, and many of us are like selling to women or we're selling more luxury brands. And um, I think people like really are concerned about the touch points, which is one of my concerns um, as well. But we've definitely grown to the point where we need a fulfillment center um, now also. So I've been looking and that's one of the people that I've I've looked at. And so it may just end up being like a, a trial and error thing, which I think is how a number of brands kind of end up doing it. Yeah. What, what did you say the name is, Karen? Sh Ship Bob. Ship Bob. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll have a look at them as well. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Catherine. Oh, sorry. You, you were saying something? Oh, I, was, uh, I don't actually work with them, but somebody recommended a fulfillment center in Long Island called uh, Ruby Haas, R-U-B-Y-H-A-S. And actually the amount of money she was paying monthly to just store store her pieces there, that it's like base, a base cost for storing and then per unit for the shipment. Um, it was actually less than what I pay for just a, a, a storage unit in Brooklyn. So it might be worth looking into if you pack in pulley bags, which I don't, if that's the thing. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, did you want to introduce yourself? She, 
I have to unmute myself first, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my business is U-Styled and I am not on the product side of things per se, other than with what we've been doing for the last four plus years with our boutique box service is really connecting designers with our clients and so thus customers. My background is my first job was actually when Bloomingdale's was buying the May company. So I was in their accounting department at Robinson's May in LA. I went to USC undergrad, no fashion focus, just like a passion for clothes my entire life, basically. Um, and because of the merger, I ended up going to BCBG as a merchandiser. And I lasted two and a half years there, which is like seven or 10. <laughs> um, and um, so I'm, I'm like, there are so many, one of the reasons why I was interested in this conversation is because, I mean, I left BCBG very much on purpose in 2008 and they're going through bankruptcy now. Um, and some of the things that I questioned was their financial decisions. And with what I'm seeing in the fashion industry, even with Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom and whatever, it's like the product is the solution, but the challenge is getting the product to the consumers. And so that's kind of actually where I'm still, I'm refocusing some of my efforts with you styled um, in that focusing on education and connecting, not as much styling and otherwise partnering with designers on how do we get the product out there that women actually really want and need. And how do we get that into the stores? Because when I was a merchandiser, my frustration was that they kept buying the same thing over and over again. <laughs> but then design would want to design something crazy. So it's like, you have to meet in the middle. So anyways, that's, that's what brings me here. So anyone that I can support um, in that perspective for or, or way, I'm happy to um, be in styling for over eight years. So I have a really good sense of what women really want and need. Our clients are all over the place and um, ages, bodies, colors, careers, etc so fantastic is there anything that you wanted to that you need from the group you haven't asked um you know i'm if you have any companies or organizations that are wanting to approach the topic of style and how you show up as a leader i talk to the five c's of leadership style power so how women can find their style and empower themselves through finding their own style um, giving them those tools through those five um, principles. And so I do workshops and roundtables around that, and that will fund everything that I'll be able to do <laughs> from the content and education perspective for free. So um, that would be, if anyone comes to mind. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, okay. Kendra, do you want to do a quick intro? And yeah. ask? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, I was more about helping women be empowered. So um, the brand that I'm about to launch is called Be Love Flow. It's um, bath soaks and oils made for meditation and balance. Uh, it's basically about um, being yourself, which is love. And then once you're love, you're basically in alignment. There's much, much more. But um, I think once I get into the package design, which should be done in like a week, I may need help and guidance there. But other Otherwise, that's pretty much it. I'm just head down right now. I'm just getting it done. So, Awesome. Well, you've got a little group to reach out to that I'm sure could help as you get to your next stage. Excellent. Uh, all right. So Liz, where's Liz? Sorry, I have to unmute. Um, <laughs> I was so late to the calls. Um, my daughter decided to take forever to fall asleep. Um, so uh, I... I don't know if, I, if a lot of people saw my post. Um, I'll start with, um, I am the former co-founder of Onyx Bags. Um, and I say former because as of last week, I decided to also move on. And that was kind of what my post was on Dreamers and Doers, that my um, co-founder had decided to move on from Onyx. And I was kind of at a crossroads. They still wanted to join the call because um, I'm looking into doing two different things. Um, one is joining with like an advisor slash mentor of mine that has helped me build our luxury bag brand um, and doing workshops. Um, her forte, yeah, she worked in um, the luxury industry for like 25 plus years. Um, and 
like, and the mine is on the, I guess, like the startup side of things of like how to start from scratch versus like having worked at, you know, like Smithens and Burberry. Um, and so we're looking into partnering to doing like consultancy and workshops. And then on the other side, I'm still kind of potentially toying around with the idea of um, another product, but in skincare. Um, so, you know, f for example, with where we were with Onyx, uh, we did a Kickstarter campaign. Um, we did ship out um, and did the fulfillment for that. But, you know, we weren't at the next phase, which was um, kind of what Alice was saying. Um, we were looking into wholesale. So um, I still feel like I have a lot to learn when it comes to products um, that I want to entertain. So like, yeah, fulfillment and using Amazon and um, like, you know, packaging for, I guess, like it's different for skincare, obviously, than and using chemicals rather than like leather. Um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of where I am. Like, as in, I have no idea, but this, these are all <laughs> thoughts in my head. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much in the exploration phase of things. And I guess like what I can help with is definitely, um, you know, the past year and a half, I've been working with like leather goods and, you know, like European manufacturing, um, definitely on the high end side of things. So if you have any questions, you know, I've, I've always been an open book. So if you want contacts, my, you know, factories, leather suppliers, I'm like very open and willing to share those contacts um, and how we did our Kickstarter, yada, yada. But, and then in terms of ask is um, I'm kind of, because I'm in the exploration phase for both like the consultancy side and the skincare side. Um, yeah. Like I'm just like, on really knowledge gathering. So if anyone wants to catch up for an hour, um, very like, with like no real commitment and just tell me their story and, and like kind of, again, like an open book of like how they got started. And, you know, like I want to learn like processes and again, like, or like Amazon hacks or like Shopify hacks, that sort of thing. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. Okay, awesome. Marissa? Hi. Um, hi. So my company is called Your Breast Self, and it's focused on empowering women who have self-esteem issues related to breast size and just generally reshaping how we talk about boobs in society um, and perceptions around body image. So I'm starting off with small-breasted women first, um, and that is because I'm product market fit for that. Um, <laughs> and then we'll see where it goes from there. But, um, so it's basically my strategy has been like part media online community because a big part of my solution is not just the product, but giving women real tools and resources to change how they view themselves. And then I'm also developing a line of bra products. So, um, I've been building the community for about a year. Um, but I could always you know, it's, it's ongoing learning. So always use help on the content side there um, in terms of growing a blog and social media presence and community. And then also on the product side, um, I'm in sample development phase right now and um, getting close to the end, which is exciting. So I'm actually in the process of testing my prototypes on women who have small boobs. <laughs> so if you know of anyone or if you are that person and you're interested in trying cool new um, bra products, I say bra products because they're, um, it's like a line with like built-in bras essentially. So you don't have to wear a bra or worry about that. Um, hit me up if you want to be a tester or know anyone who would want to be. Um, and then I'm also going to be doing a crowdfunding campaign. So um, particularly if you're somebody who knows or has had experience doing that, um, especially with like a social mission focused business, sounds like a lot of us have businesses focused on empowering women, which is great. Um, but I could, I would love to grab coffee and talk about that as well. Cool. Um, I'll send out the email connecting everyone, but I definitely have someone in mind for you. So she, <laughs> she fits your demographic and she is the hardest person to please ever. So oh, you great. Covered on good customer. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. Olivia. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. 
Um, I have a women's wear brand called Rallier, um, which is a collection inspired by modern uniform dressing. And for every dress you buy, we donate school uniforms to girls in countries with gender inequality where there's a government requirement to wear a uniform to school. Um, my background is very much in the luxury world and, you know, Warby was launching, obviously like Tom Shoes and Feed Bags, this was back in like 2013. Um, and I didn't really understand why, um, if you're expecting like an under $100 price point to make a donation or have a social mission, why it wasn't happening more in the contemporary and luxury space. Um, so yeah, I've turned, the company turned one in February. And so I can, I wrote down a lot of your names, but I can definitely answer anyone's questions as it relates to like those early inventory setups and like all those sorts of nuts and bolts kind of questions. Um, in terms of my ask, I mean, I know Alice and we're sort of in a similar boat. We launched direct consumer, which I'm actually still really happy we did because I feel like I have such a clear understanding of who the core girl is and it's been really helpful to have a direct line to that girl um, in our first year, but we are toying around with strategic wholesale. And so um, Karen, maybe I'll send you an email also. Yeah. <laughs> almost like less about like, how do you go about doing wholesale and more, how do you do it almost as a direct consumer brand? So I know there's a lot of now like, and we talked about this with Canal Street Market, like there seems to be this sort of third option coming up where it's like, almost like a hybrid of wholesale and direct consumer, whether it's like revenue sharing or you're almost, the store is almost acting as like a landlord. Um, so we're just trying to navigate sort of what stage two is gonna be. Um, so if anyone has thoughts about wholesale or these sorts of alternative wholesale strategies, um, I'd be curious to know your thoughts. Awesome, cool. Um, okay, uh, and then I'd just like to add, oh. just in response to that question, um, and I could like go on and on about this, but at, at Bloomingdale's, I was working, I just happened to be at the right time, right place where they were starting to do a lot of leases and concession models for brands. And that was specifically a way for, to get European brands into, because that's the, you know, that was their model versus traditional wholesale. Um, I think for domestic, like direct consumer brands, one um, opportunity that Warby did, well, a couple of things. First was um, just like partnering with, with the right boutiques around the country um, and doing it as kind of like a rev share lease model. So that's definitely an option. Um, pretty much all the showrooms are, are like that. It's not like a wholesale route, especially because the fulfillment, right, is so specific there. Um, but another um, thing that I always recommend for people to check out is the Nordstrom pop-in arrangement and project that they do. I think um, it's just a great way to like be in the middle of these huge A plus department store spaces, floor spaces, but like you can, you know, they, we, do, we did one at Warby and you can really design the space and make it really feel still like heavily yours, which I know is super important. So yeah, that's one, I always recommend people to check out and explore. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Laura. Uh, okay, Sarah, you're up. You want to do a quick intro and an ask if you have one? Sure. I'll be fast because I actually have to run to another meeting. Um, but hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Weinrub. I'm the founder of MB. Uh, we're a multi-brand retailer. Hi, Olivia. <laughs> we're a multi-brand retailer focused on curating uh, ethical and sustainable fashion for a lean, mindful wardrobe. So it's all mix and match, all really comfortable, day to night, all that fun stuff. Um, so I guess, I mean, it sounds like a lot of us are in the same boat in terms, and I mean, Olivia and Allison, I have all talked a lot about this, but um, second year blues, how do you scale, especially as a bootstrapping startup? Karen, I know we've talked about this too. Um, so that's, I think, my biggest challenge right now is just um, I'm a year and a half in and I'm doing okay, but like not okay enough to do this forever and, you know not make money and pay myself and all that fun stuff. So just trying to figure out how to scale and if my model is a viable business model. Um, and if not, what I would want to pivot it to, because that's also something I've been thinking a lot about. And I'm happy to talk to anybody from a retailer perspective. I'm not Bloomingdale's or Barney's, but if you're trying to get into smaller boutiques um, and interested in, um, I'm e-commerce only, but interested in that, I'm happy to chat about that. Can you awesome. repeat your name, the, the site name, Sarah? It's MB, I-M-B-Y. 
stands for in my backyard because everything we sell is made in America. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know that. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that. Like people who've been customers for a long time, they're like, wait, what? <laughs> be better possible. Cool. Um, all right. So everyone has gotten a chance to introduce themselves. But if I missed anyone, just raise your hand. I apologize. Um, really quickly, I guess I'll end. I'm Karen um, and I'm the founder of Be Shave, O U I S A J V E dot com. Um, so, women's shave brand um, sort of elevates the experience of women shaving. Um, so, it's for women by women. And um, I have been in business for a couple years. Uh, like I said, I have a wholesale background. I primarily launched the, the line um, direct to consumer, but we have gotten picked up um, this year in urban free people and we're going into anthropology as well this summer. So um, pretty excited about that. So if, I, if I can be uh, of help with regards to wholesale um, or if I can be of help with regards to scaling, um, I have been scaling the business relatively quickly um, as a direct to consumer um, brand and we're completely bootstrapped um, and I will be starting the process of raising um, in a few months as well. So, you know, I'm here to help in any way that I can um, and I don't want to take up too much more time. We're actually going to finish up. So I wanted to throw it back to Laura um, as our wonderful uh, I don't know if she'd be the host. I, I guess I'd be the host, but our wonderful sort of center of attention <laughs> um, for the call. Thank you so much for, for your time and all the fantastic advice and all your learnings from um, your experience at Warby. And so we just want to finish up with, um, with you. Let us know, you know, when are you launching? What's the website? Oh, yeah. And if yeah. there's anything we can help you with. Um, definitely there's, okay. So here's my, my home office rack of samples here. Um, product really quickly. I can't hear you guys, but, um, yeah. So as I mentioned, it's like all just, you know, easy, like slips, robes, um, everything is hand, hand woven in India. It's like nice cool up hands. Um, I think. It was just shot by um, this Instagram celebrity photographer friend, Alice Gao. I think Alice, that's how maybe she mentioned that you knew, knew her. Um, yeah, so it's I'm about a month out. So anything you guys can do to spread the word. I just landed on a name yesterday from <laughs> Trademark. So really fresh. It's going to be called Par on Par, P-A-R space E-N space P-A-R. Um, you know, I'm sure this is like reminiscing of a lot of your journeys, but I have stuff taped to the wall and um, branding all in, in the works. Um, it, it's short for doors wide open in Spanish, de par en par. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I definitely will share the website once it's launched, follow, share, all that good stuff. Um, this is the first time where I felt like um, it was so helpful to hear all of your backgrounds at the end because a lot of the stuff like, you know, where am I going to fulfill out of um, are questions that I've had. And it was just such a nice feeling to end on this note of like support and community. So thank you so much for doing that, Karen. I wasn't expecting to get that from this call. Um, so that was really, really amazing. Par on par. Par on par. Well, I think it's an amazing name. And when you held up those pants, you had a customer in me in like a hot <laughs> second. So I'm super excited to see what's to come. And uh, yeah, let's, let's grab a drink and chat some more. Yeah. Um, it was so wonderful to chat with all of you guys. We're all in this together. We're all here to help. And I think we all, you know, find that Dreamers Doers is a fantastic, um, you know, little group to be a part of. So as I said, I will follow up with email so that you can kind of, you know, uh, connect from there and help each other out. And um, I think uh, Dreamers is going to uh, potentially follow up as well. And um, we have a recording of, um, of the call. They have a recording of the call so that we, you know, if there's anything that we kind of missed or want to go over again, we'll have access to that too. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks, Laura. Awesome. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. <laughs>